Well, okay, that, uh, uh, there's an interesting point. So you see, what has been left out in that citation of verses are the blatantly clear ones in Galatians. So let's start there. In Galatians chapter 5, and verse 3, and verse 21, Paul says, If I were still preaching circumcision in the flesh, that is, why am I being persecuted? That proves that Paul is not, not, not preaching circumcision in the flesh. He couldn't have said that otherwise. And what is it in Galatians 5.3? I yeah. declare to every man who gets himself physically circumcised that he's bound to observe the entire law. Don't do it, Paul says. Do not get physically circumcised. If you do, there's a whole set of laws that go with it. Don't go there. And he's impassioned against the threat of the Jewish unbelievers there who are trying to get Paul on board with physical circumcision. All right, here's how you think about Paul. Paul has two positions, very smartly. If he's trying to win people for the faith, he will say one thing, to bring them along, to accommodate, to please them, if you like. If, however, he's talking to converted, baptized Christian people in the church, he will fight to the death not to allow any, anybody to force the law upon them. That's to say, the law of circumcision. So what that list of verses did not tell us was the verses which make it absolutely clear what they mean. So Paul then circumcised Timothy, you remember the text, because of the Jews. That's clear. He did it as a concession to the Jews. Circumcision, Paul also said, is nothing, and uncircumcision is also nothing. It makes not a whit of difference to anybody now, whether you are physically circumcised or not. Here's another thing. In the law of Moses, when circumcision is first declared, in the time of Abraham, actually, Jews and Gentiles all had to be physically circumcised to be part of the covenant. And Paul says the precise opposite. He says in Galatians 5.3 that he's not preaching physical circumcision. Don't do it if you do it and the whole law that goes with it. So I want our question, if you would kindly think out this point. What is this whole law which Paul says you must not keep? Because if you do, you're doing away with the cross and you've become unchristian. You've lost the faith. So there's a stark contrast between the law of Moses in the flesh, in the letter, and the spiritual law of Christ, which is a fulfillment. Now, Jesus himself said that all foods were clean there in Mark 7, 19. It was a comment written by Mark, as I think they later understood. I'm not sure if they even understood it when he said it. But as they looked back, they saw that Jesus was making all foods clean. That's in Mark 7, 19, I think. That is not, absolutely not, affirming the food laws. In Romans 14, verses 14 and 20, Paul said, I'm convinced, and he's a Jew and a Christian. I, Paul, am convinced, and I'm with Paul on this, that nothing is unclean of itself, he's talking about foods, unless you think it is, then your conscience is weak, get over it. But nothing is, is unclean in itself. And then in verse 20, all things, talking about foods, are clean. He is not enforcing the food laws. He never enforced the Sabbath. He does sometimes, in order to win Jews, accommodate to them to bring them along. So Paul has two positions. One, in view of trying to win Jews to the faith. They're not already there. Secondly, a quite different and firmer position, once they are part of the Christian faith, then they should not be physically circumcised. That is very radical. But that's clearly, I think, what Paul said. I tell you, all of you, in 5.3 of Galatians, don't get circumcised in the flesh. If you do, but don't do it. If you do, you're going to have to keep the whole law. Stay away from that. Come with Paul into complete freedom. Colossians 2, the whole of the calendar there. The Sabbath, that's the weekly Sabbath, the annual holy days, and the new moons monthly. The whole thing is a single shadow which has been replaced 
by Messiah, who is the risen Christ now at the right hand of the Father. This shouldn't be difficult, but some of you get off on the wrong track and you think, oh, this is in the Ten Commandments and therefore it must be binding. That's just false. Because the Ten Commandments in the letter, according to Second Corinthians 3, are gone, are over, passé, finished. Moses in the letter. I want to add one point that I've been reading about this morning. Strat Billebeck, the famous uh, five-volume thing, all in German, not in English, but a very interesting commentary from the Jewish writings on the New Testament. One of the rabbis said, if you keep the Torah perfectly well now, this is not anything like the Torah of Messiah, which will be binding in the Christian era. They recognize that the Torah of Messiah, as opposed to the Torah of Moses, was vastly superior and a new interpretation. So all that was foreseen. Jesus, you know, said, I can't tell you all of this right now. He might, indeed, he said, tithe your vegetables. He's not talking to us as Christians in that verse. He's talking to Jews under the law in that particular verse. And the rabbis recognized that the Messiah would make the Torah honorable. There's a text which says that in Isaiah. I don't have it at my fingertips. But the Messiah, the Son of God to come, will make the law honorable and heighten it. So here's the simple truth to keep in mind. We Christians are under the Torah of Messiah, not under the letter of the Torah of Moses. That distinction needs to be kept in mind always. Um, the history of Luke, as I call it, mm -hmm. uh, he has things like this said uh, by Paul. Mm -hmm. uh, but this I do admit to you that according to the way, which they call a sect, mm -hmm. I, Paul, mm. speaking here, worship the God of our ancestors, and I believe everything that is in accordance with the law and written mm -hmm. in the prophets. Mm -hmm. And then le the last chapter, which ends actually in Rome, so mm -hmm. the history of Luke ends in Rome. By mm -hmm. that time, mm -hmm. Paul has written most of his epistles, they say. Certainly. Obviously, I think definitely Galatians he's written. Oh, certainly. And it says three days later, he called together the leaders of the Jews, Paul, that is, when they get gathered. He said, my brothers, although I had done nothing against our people, our customs, mm. I was handed over to the Romans as a prisoner from Jerusalem. Yeah. So how can we harmonize that with the clear uh, epistles as you, as you mm. cited in Galatians and Romans? Well, because he's very clever. Uh, subtle in saying that he's done nothing against the law and the law itself looked forward to the Torah of Messiah. We've got to think progressively here. Yes, the Torah of Moses in the letter is old and finished. But even in the Old Testament, the Messiah is going to make the law honorable. Jesus kept saying, I'm fulfilling the law. Paul was entirely in agreement with Jesus' progressive view of the Torah. It's not the Torah in the letter. So if 1 Corinthians 9 solves all problems. He says, I, Paul, am not under the law, but I am under the law of God by being under the Torah of Messiah. Even the Old Testament foresaw that. So Paul is clear, clearly without conscience, in terms of having broken any letter of the law of Moses. You just have to think in terms of the higher law, which from the beginning, as the rabbis even recognized, the Torah of Messiah is way ahead of the Torah of Moses. He can say that. If it keeps people happy, he'll say it. He actually circumcises Timothy to keep the Jews at bay. But I think 1 Corinthians 9 is perfectly clear. I'm all things to all men. I, Paul, am not under the law. And yet I am under the law of God by being in the Torah of Messiah. And in Galatians, he says, if you love your neighbor as yourself, you've fulfilled the Torah of Messiah. So you keep that distinction between the Torah of God under Moses in the letter and the very different thing, which is the Torah of Messiah in the spirit, which Paul is very keen to keep. They're not the same law. But what has, must happen in these discussions, Galatians is quite clear. Paul is not teaching circumcision. 
it is hopeless to try to cut the Gordian knot there by saying, well, he couldn't be writing to Jews. He obviously is. That's not going to work. So I think this is unnecessary confusion. Paul has two standards. One, to win people, accommodating them. And secondly, the absolute Christian standard, which he doesn't budge on. Don't get physically circumcised. If you do, you must keep the whole law. Rejoice, Jews and Gentiles alike. Be free. Mm. I think that's probably the best solution. Yeah, that's the uh, so-called traditional view of 1 Corinthians 9. So this is for um, unconverted, unbelieving Jews. Um, to win them. Right. How does this apply, though, to Jews that are Christian, like in Acts 21, 24? Mm -hmm. You not only have a, a believing Jew, but you have uh, James, the Lord's brother, who mm -hmm. asks Paul to take a, uh, a vow of some, of some kind. There's some debate yes. about whether it's a Nazarite vow. Yeah. And then he says, in this way, everyone will know there's nothing to the reports mm -hmm. that have been given about you. But yes. you yourself live in observance yes. of the law. So how would the First Corinthians 9 argument mm. work? Because this is to win over non-Christians, non-Christian Jews, yeah. with this passage yeah. here. And, and even Acts 15, where they have this situation in the Jerusalem yes. church. So how can mm. we apply this, which is clearly to non-believers, for believers? You know what I mean? Well, yes, Acts 15, I think, is not the final answer. There's a progress here. I don't think James got this right either. What they did in Acts 15 is not what Paul finally does. James was slower to see it. Peter had to be nudged to get it right. Paul is the leader here. And in Galatians, I think he's unmistakable. Don't get circumcised. Don't do it. If you do, you're going to have to keep all those food laws and Sabbaths and the rest of it. So Paul, whatever is exactly in his mind, he worked it out. I think he can, he can cover himself. If you realize there are two standards of Paul to, to be thought of in a linear fashion. One is to win people, and a different standard once he's won them, and especially when somebody comes to try to attack him and they reintroduce the law, then he takes a totally different position. That's the best I can do with that. Some of the commentaries, by the way, I think are very wrong. Even F.F. F. Bruce doesn't <laughs> seem to get it right. Well, what, what, uh, just for the benefit of our viewers, what does most of uh, scholarship have to say about this, let's call it tension between the portrayal of Paul in Acts yeah. and his own portrayal in his letters? Well, they love it. They love it. And they all say different things. F.F. F. Bruce said there's no evidence that Paul was against circumcision in his letters. That's just false. Galatians is quite clear. The only way around that would be to say, well, Paul's not writing to Gentiles or only to Gentiles. That's not going to work either. So the model actually is extreme, but I'm not surprised at that. There's mass confusion in practically every doctrine. Don't need that. Try something simple. Paul has two standards, mm -hmm. two different occasions. So right? how is the law of Christ different? I guess it's the question to the law yes. of Moses. No, well, totally, because Paul is busy saying, don't get circumcised. That's the law of Moses. He's busy saying, don't keep the food laws. That's the law of Moses in the letter. Now, all of that can be spiritualized. There are spiritual meanings for all of that. But Paul says that he's within the law of Messiah. I've already mentioned that even the rabbis said that when the Torah of Messiah comes, they use that very phrase in the uh, commentary on Ecclesiastes, I think it is. When the Torah of Messiah comes, all of the Torah keeping of Moses you do now will be nothing. Huge difference. Jesus has got a new era going. He's the risen Messiah. Moses is dead. We have to get over this failure to see the vast gaping gap between the two forms. One in the letter, Moses, that's finished, Second Corinthians 3. The law of Messiah is the risen Messiah working through his spirit in us now. And woe betide anybody who tries to mix them. If you meet people who say, well, they're keeping the weekly Sabbath, they're going to circumcise their children, it means they've not understood the Christian faith. We need to help them. Um, just to go back quickly, you said something hmm. in, in, along the lines of James didn't get this yeah. right either. Yeah. Um, 
that stage. Would that be true for the rest of the apostles in the Jerusalem church? I don't know. Peter, we know, was slow. James, I think, is progressing. Paul is the leader. Paul has to bring them all into line eventually. I'm working with Paul. Paul has given us most of the New Testament. So it's hard to judge exactly where Peter and James would have been. But certainly in Acts 15, it's not the end. Right. Um, I've worked at that point, but it's not the end product, I think. Do you agree that the uh, verdict of the council divided the church at that time? No. I don't think it divided the church. They, I don't know exactly who was progressing at what speed, but Paul has sorted it all out. Because if we take... Uh, yeah people like apostles like James and Peter mm -hmm. as representative of mm -hmm. not just the rest of the apostles, but the Jerusalem church mm -hmm. as a group there, mm -hmm. in that area. But we aren't at the end of the story yet. So what? That's a historical thing of great interest. But I don't care. It makes no reference to us today. Mm -hmm. We've got Paul's final word on this. So they aren't there yet. I think that's quite right. But that's not the final word. I'm taking the latest. Sure. And that is Galatians. And um, what people tend not to do is to not read the texts in Galatians, which are so clear and decisive. James perhaps got there later. I, I, reading the book of James, you have a little bit more of a Jewish flavor sometimes, but I don't think he's in disagreement with where Paul finally got to. Yeah, the chronology is, is important, of course. Yes. By, but by all uh, scholarship and, and all mm. history, the events of Acts 21, which mm -hmm. are called the last trip or the fourth yes. trip of yes. Paul to Jerusalem, mm -hmm. uh, that's dated to the late 50s. Yeah. Um, so 57, 58 maybe. Yeah. So that's pretty late in the game. So when yes. you say, well, they didn't get it at that time. No, I didn't say that time. I the, said they didn't get it in Acts 15. Right. But in Acts 21, which yeah. is almost 30 years mm -hmm. maybe 20 years later mm -hmm. after the mm -hmm. council mm -hmm. james still doesn't sound like he's uh progressed because he says look just yep. do this so uh, everyone we we all know we all know your torah observant so just do this and that's <laughs> late 50s would you agree yeah. yes but it doesn't matter to me in the slightest it's an academic argument about history it has no reference to me today and there's so much practical stuff that I, that's the way I'm looking. I don't know that James was straight even then. I don't think he contradicts Paul. He doesn't say that salvation is by works. No. So he, he does have to, to modify a misunderstanding of Paul when he says, you see that salvation is by works and not by faith alone. There he's coming against a false understanding of Paul. Paul would, agree, would have agreed with that. I see no discrepancy. Exactly what was in James's mind in that later thing. You're right. I'm not sure. But it doesn't alter anything I do today, as far as I know. Yeah. No, they're definitely in fellowship. It actually says yes. time and again, they, right. in, in, in both trips, Acts 15 and Acts 21, mm. 